All right, if you could take your seats, we are ready for our final session of the day and the conference. Are you as excited as I am? <laughs> All right, so our next and final session is titled AI and NLP for Fraud Detection, Deeper Look at Deep Nets. It's going to be led by Vishal Anand, he's from Microsoft, and, our, uh, and his bio, is Vishal is an in inventor and seasoned data scientist, authoring patent filings and trade secrets in the ML NLP space, and has created state-of-the-art prediction systems at the scale of Fortune 100 firms. An alumni of Columbia University and Indian Institute Technology, Vishal works at Microsoft. Please welcome him to the stage. Thanks for the introduction. Hey, how's everyone doing? I'm excited because I was supposed to land in New York at 6.55 a.m., but I landed in Baltimore instead. So I took a train, and I reached here 30 minutes back. So I'm excited as well. <laughs> so yeah, what do you think we are here for? Like, What exactly do, you want, do we want to know about NLP and AI for fraud detection in here? What are your expectations? I'll, I'll steer to that. Do you have insights? Like, you can just like shout out. How do you think about reducing false positives? Great. How do you build threat models? Great. Awesome. So, so we want to be more technical and less of business, but I'm trying to combine them both because I think there is a gap there, and firms out there want to have the best models out, but I think the ethics behind it is more important. So I, I was at Visa Inc. for a couple of years, where I worked on, on those systems, and I was at Uber working on pricing division. So I worked on some stuffs, and I wanted to share my insights on them. So do we work on fraud detection, or what do we really want to work on? Sorry? Great, you have it. <laughs> so I'll go a step further, and let's discuss about what it really means to reduce fraud or prevent fraud. Can we have a model which predicts what can happen five years down the line? So there are already projects out there you might, you might have browsed through journals and stuff, wherein they say that what would be the future of a specific app five years down the line? Instagram was not supposed to ever have stories, but it does have now. And keep in mind, these opinions are reflective of me and not of my firms. So I'm, I'm taking names, but these are not associated with Microsoft. So the history through which an app evolves, the same can be said for a transaction or a business. Can we predict a business or a customer who is using a service which wants to prevent fraud, will it go rogue five years later? Because we can identify the patterns and we can just clip it. But if you think about it, is it ethical? The second point is, if the next transaction will go default, that's a much shorter scale. That's, that's probably not as bad. So let me go into like the societal biases. So you might have read about case studies about how the credit scores might be biased. I say might be because I think they are, but people have different opinions on that. The credit scoring across the demographies are biased and people have very different opinions. I would not touch on them because they, are, they might be volatile. There's another case study which I can share, the police versus crime density. Let's say a region has a lot of crime. Let's say the police are X percent in there. Do we increase the police density in there to X plus something, or do we decrease it because it's already too bad? If it's too bad, if we take the police away and put it somewhere else, would it help the other regions, or would it make the first region worse? These are questions which uh, instigate thoughts about uh, causality and causation. But if at all we have to use these models, how can we make it more precise? 
So that would be the main agenda that I will be discussing about. So models versus accuracy. So in front, you have two models, let's say 95% and 98%. What would you choose? Feel free to shout out. So these two models in a business accurately predict how many would go bust, like how many would default. So one says with 95% accuracy, the other says with 98%. Can we take a guess of what we should choose? Sorry? OK. Does someone think we can? No. OK. That's smart. What if I said there was 100%? Absolutely not. Oh my god. Everyone is so smart, <laughs> which is good, which is good. Because there are two reasons why this should not happen. The first is, it's not just about making the systems fraud safe. We also have to ensure the business goes in. Because yes, we can reject everything, and we can have no business coming in, zero. And there are firms out there which promise, which I'll touch on later, how they do it. They talk about how they're fraud proof, but what they miss out on is how effective they are, like someone said here about false positive, false negative. So those things come into play as well. And since this being a non-technical track, I wanted to touch upon how this is actually important, not just the numbers, but the thought that something like this can also happen and we might be blindsided. But the second point is probably more important. These days we have a lot of models, great models, and we have no idea how they work. They need to be interpretable. So when people say that when you write code, you should have logs. So in case there are some exceptions, we can like trigger, like we can do root cause analysis and figure out why they're happening the way they are. It's the same thing for a model as well. We can just blindly reject someone. And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, last year I was working on something and it was a spam filter model someone had created. It was really accurate. But the moment we deployed, it simply went bust. It wouldn't do anything. And the reason was quite simple. In our testing sample, of course, uh, somehow the model learned that the number of words in the subject was the indicator. And with 98% confidence just on that feature, it would predict, hey, it's a spam. That makes no sense. So models need to be interpretable. So it's not just about saying, hey, this doesn't work. Let's reject it. We should understand why it's rejecting the way it is. And if that's the case, there's 98% and 95% with equal like false positive, false negatives, and F1 scores, pick the one you better understand, even if, if it means like a higher fraud, because you know what you're doing. Because someday, let's say something goes wrong, the company will go bankrupt, maybe. Who knows? So that's the more important part, not just about how effective we are. And I was mentioning about the industry offerings of how firms say that we are fraud safe with some person, or like, are they offering, uh, uh, they're offering insurance, not insurance, but a promise that if, if we let a fraudulent transaction go through, we'll give up this person of the transaction to, to the consumer, which makes sense. But we have to understand the different kinds of fraudulent transactions that can happen. And they have very different uh, approaches. The first is, of course, guarantees versus no guarantees. So the firms which do not offer guarantees are, are more free to experiment and do the right thing. The ones with guarantees are more concerned about going bankrupt and taking over the market share. Because firms like Visa Inc it can experiment. Others have to be, they have to give some sort of uh, cash back kind of thing. So guarantees and no guarantees can have their pros and cons, but we should understand, are we going to a firm just because their guaranteeing will be fraud safe in the event we're not? We have to be careful about that. The second thing is the card transactions are authorized in settlement. So the settlements can happen from three months to six months. They might also happen in a week. 
So there can be two kinds of fraud prevention. The authorization can simply be declined if the card is not present. If we know that the zip code doesn't match the, the issuer bank's information, these things are quick. The settlement is much different. Let's say you don't have enough uh, funds. That can be a fraud. There's another fraudulent transaction I, I came across three years back. Uh, a group of hackers took a bunch of cards, tried out all possible sorts of pins, zip codes, at once for the same card. What do we do? We are only quick enough for a few milliseconds, but they happened at once. There are so many cards out there. These things, how do we work? These things are about authorization and settlement. Wallets are much different. They might have locks and other kind of stuffs because it's controlled in a central reserve of the offering financial organization. So we have to understand the models before we speak about reducing fraud or preventing them from occurring. Now, the traditional fraud mechanisms, uh, I would like to know what you guys think used to happen or are happening so I can better address and share my insights. What kind of fraud mechanisms used to happen or maybe they happen right now so I can understand if the industry is where it is right now or maybe things are not as advanced as they should be. All right, I'll just jump into it. The default thing someone thinks about is decision tree. If you're buying a Starbucks of $3.65, I have never drunk off in my life, so I wouldn't know the cost, but <laughs> uh, if you do that, would it be wise to turn down a reject, turn down a transaction because you think it's probably not safe, or would you be rather more confident of rejecting a transaction which is maybe $2,000 Worth because if it is, if it is worth two thousand dollars, you can uh, like it has happened to me. You would cancel the reject, cancel the authorization, and then ask the consumer to repeat the transaction. It happens a lot of times when you are doing uh, international transactions for like flights or something. And these things are essentially decision trees. We think about USDs. What's the issuing card country? How many countries we have used? Once I was in the UK, the first uh, international visit of my life, I swiped my card, and that was the only card I had. I had no cash. It got declined. I tried again. It got declined again. This time I entered a different pin. Third time I was rejected, and my card was blocked. It turns out my pin was actually right the first time. The second time I should have tried the same one. It was a fraud mechanism to prevent someone stealing my card, but this time I had to live without cash for a week. But what would have been worse if someone took it from me? So these are very simple, but these are based on heuristics. We think, hey, let's do this. And we can put machine learning into it. We can say that, hey, take these data, data sets, and then figure out what should be the uh, conversation between the features and the models, and we can see something like this. If the USD amount is more than X dollars, just reject it. No questions asked. Yes, we'll be right with certain percent of accuracy because that's how the data set is made, and we'll be blindsided into thinking we're doing good, but we're just terrible. The next is feature engineering. People talk a lot about features in machine learning models, but what really is a feature? I used to think that, hey, let's create these features. Like Companies like Visa might have X number of features. MasterCard might have like Y number of features. I cannot tell you the numbers, but they have a certain num number of features, and they're very specific. They cater to individual parts of transaction which can go wrong. They might include things like, what's your velocity? Like How many times have you been using and with a rolling average of uh, expenditures so that all of a sudden, if you shoot up or what was the last location and the next location if you do? Does it make sense? Could you have taken a flight? Could you have taken a train? Does it make sense? Those kind of things. But if you really think about it, features is nothing but the actual data. You're trying to reduce it to something machines can understand. 
if I'm saying a sentence, we guys might understand for ones who are familiar with English, but maybe the computers cannot. They understand binaries. So for them, we have to just tell them that these are the features they do not know that velocity is velocity. They think it's something, it's a one or a zero. And they work on that, the models just work. We are essentially overfitting. But if we have dropouts and stuff, I'm trying to not go technical because this is a business track, but feel free to like talk to me later on. But feature essentially means we want the machines to know as much as we do because it's an analog data which we are transforming to digital. So there is a loss of data. We want to minimize it while making sure the machines understand or else if we do not minimize, it's essentially the same as a person saying, hey, do you think this transaction is fraudulent? They'll say yes or no, that's the thing. The next thing is random forest. This is more prevalent. Random forest essentially means we take a lot of decision trees and group them together. Some decision trees work good for APAC region, some work good for EMEA regions, and so on and so forth. And they have like d very different use cases. Let's say the country I come from, we have to enter pins every time. And not just that, we are also sent a one-time password on our cell phone to make sure it is we who are initiating the transaction. We cannot do that in the US because US is a consumer friendly nation and we want people to spend. The same is not true from the country I come from. So they have very different use cases, they have very different uh, goals. And this is why ran random forests are great because we can understand what's what and we take the best of both worlds. Ensemble essentially means a combination. What are we missing? We have everything, it works, we understand, because we can see the decision tree. Like I said, can we predict what's going to happen and make sure we are ethical about it? We cannot just cancel out all transactions which comes from a specific neighborhood of New York because the, the fraud rate tends to be high. We have to be smart about it. So we can pick on a node Let's say we have a visualization and we look at a specific node, let's say the one in green, and we hover around and see similar behaviors in other people and are they fraudulent or not. So this can be equated to an NLP problem in which, um, let's say, Twitter data. There are a lot of fake profiles out there in which people just say, hey, I love this government and they, they drive the wave of enthusiasm and uh, support. And Brexit had some interesting conversations with the government and there were iffy situations in the US as well. So these things can be better captured and if you visualize it in a Bayesian graph in which we take the machine learning models and try to understand why the frauds are happening, like why do we think it is a fraudulent transaction, then we'll have a better understanding. We can just identify the groups. Oh, these guys are trying to, uh, like, I'm forgetting the right word, but they're trying to like s siphon it to terrorist organizations. Or someone is trying to take money and embezzle it. Things like that. Or someone who is just broke and they found a nice way to buy something, return it, and block the card. They got the stuff for free, they can sell it off. Things like these have happened at the scale of tens of thousands of dollars, even at Uber. There were cases in which people found out a flaw in the system and they earned quite a lot, but they were tracked down a couple of years later. But I cannot share more. If we just click on a node, we can find a lot about it. But getting to this is hard because it's about interpretation of the model. It's not just about accuracy anymore. The false positive and false negatives are good, but I'll get to that. How can we address the false positive and false negatives? In these kind of spaces, we can just think about man, woman, uncle, aunt, king, queen. If we map them on a, on a shared space, we can see a direct vector with the same length. Sometimes these lead to questions about, are we being sexist? 
are we, are our languages not f feminist enough? But the thing is, these are learning from the samples we have. If the samples are itself biased, what can the machines do? They're just learning from what is being told to them. It's like telling a kid, hey, you have to be good. But the kid sees wrong things happening all around, and then the kid is at loss. He learns to lie, or she learns to lie. And things go on and so forth. Um, so in this space, we can find some really interesting things. China and Beijing. These, this is trained on, uh, this is from Google's paper by Vic, by Richard, sorry, by Chris Manning from Stanford. Um, they, took, um, they took Wikipedia's data and then they trained on it. China and Beijing are at a distance and so is Moscow and Russia. These kind of information we can also decipher from the transactional data. Why do we limit ourselves to what we are just seeing just by the cards, by the signature, by the human verification that, can you see um, how many cards are there in this uh, picture, the capture? We can go a step further. We can identify the pictures, maybe, the one who is actually clicking. I think China has tracked persons on the streets. That's a step forward, but we have to be careful. Things like these can be mapped into a shared space, and then we are learning from our environment. They might be biased, but it's better off than not using them. Because it's more data, so it tends to prevent undersampling when we have lesser information in a specific scenario. Let's talk of this. The moment when Brad Wars opened, Berkshire Hathaway increased by 2.61%. Annie Hath Hathaway and Berkshire Hathaway. The market didn't know. They used their models. They mistimed, but no one lost. But this could have also caused crash and bankruptcy of a firm if the models were so trained. We didn't have enough control. This 2.61% decrease could have meant success and failure for another firm. So before 2012, I would rather say 2008, when we would take in natural language processing, there would be things like tokenization, like we'd just take a sentence, split it into recognizable chunks, parts of speech, chunking. Chunking essentially like walking becomes walk. Named entity recognition is something a person, is it a digit, is it an object, things like that. Co-reference, semantic role labeling. These are some stuffs which used to exist and people would like keep on like working harder and harder on it before the neural nets came in. But even then, while we were in the transition phase, we had hidden Markov models which, which took into consideration the, the causality and the causation parts of events, the probability. So we would look at what's the percent in which an action can lead to the next. And based on that, we would take some decision. But this had an obvious flaw. We would never go into the, uh, the case in which it doesn't happen in the majority case. Because everyone exists. Every kind of things can happen in the future. But the models would simply work for most of the cases, but not for others. They came up with probabilistic CFGs, lexicalized PCFGs log linear models. These were really good until we got into the AI. Now we have really great models, long short term memory networks. Right now, whatever I'm saying, you guys might remember till the end of the day, maybe. A year later, probably not. You'll remember some stuff, not everything. That's long short term memory. That's how humans work. That's what neural network is all about. It's the neurons in our head, autoencoders. Everything that we do, Maybe you're writing, some of you are writing notes. What are those? Those are summaries. Those are encodings of what I'm saying. We are auto-encoding the states into machines, which can then dereference, because machines can only take up so much inputs, or else we're just giving it everything, and then models are slow. We cannot have slow stuffs. Generative adversarial networks. Let's say I see a chair in here. What's the color of the chair, I ask myself. I would say it's black. 
but have I seen this specific color before in my life? Probably not. But I've seen enough to understand this is black. That's generative adversarial networks. We see enough samples and then we generate things of their kind. It's good, but then we are biasing ourselves with the biases we have already trained with. If we see someone from a specific region of, let's say, New York, and we judge them, unless we correct for it, we'll keep judging them. The fourth one is something I'm working on, and there are some people in Princeton also working on it. It's called Unified Models, which goes to the next step. Uh, you can have their slides later on. What's the unified model? Why are we limiting ourselves to just text? Or maybe just the transactions and how long it took for you to complete a transaction? Because those things are valid elements. We can take in the sound, we can take in the video, we can take in the augmented reality. Things have gone way ahead. The gaming industry is huge. There might be a lot of chances of fraudulent transactions there. And by the way, it's it's much higher than music or movie industry, gaming industry. Those have gone into augmented reality and we never know. And the only way we can be fraud preventive if we are ahead of the black hats. So this is something, uh, uh, this is a library in Python in TensorFlow in case you guys are interested, in which you can understand why something is grouped within a specific circle. We can see why it caused a specific sentence to be landed within this cluster and what's their contribution. This is fairly easy. It, it takes some time to figure out the right libraries to use, but these are important, but these are not as quick. And there's something I, I did last year before I graduated from Columbia. I took in a video I treated it like a text. I converted it to text, and then I found out the probabilities of what I'm really seeing. Is it a cab? Is it a traffic light? Is it an ambulance? Is it a police van? You can see that the M transit in there looks like, it has like red lights, so it might seem like a police van. But these things, can we combine it with audio? Can we combine it with the other transactional data that we have? And these things are more important because then we are trying to like de-bias our models from things we have already seen so that we can steer away from the problem that the credit calculation happens in the US. They might be biased on demography. It's not good, but it's working. But we can make it better. And there's something so the top one is hard to read for me, hard for me to remember, but a computer can guess it very quick. Second one, computer cannot guess it as quick. It will take it 550 years, but we find it very easy to learn. Why is it the case? Because it essentially comes down to how good our models are, how's the interpretability. But the more important part, someone also raised about, I'll touch on now because yes, you can have great models, you can, train it, you can read up papers, find out their binary files and run it. You'll get great models, but understanding why we should do it, the power is good, but, but how we use it is more important. And this is why I wanted to touch it at the end, but the answer is simple. It was, uh, this was not by me, but it was in 2014, I guess, or 2015, I forget. Uh, in Vancouver, there was a meeting and then they decided on something called dropouts. So when we train, we knowingly drop out 40 to 35% of the information. And if our model works great on that data, we discard even the training data. And on the test data, if we perform well, it means that we have been generalized enough. And that's something we can use it to better control false positives and false negatives because the ideal would be like the F1 score should be controlled, but the moment we like test it on a testing sample and go back to train, it's no longer a testing sample. It becomes a training sample because we took in the feedback and we retrained it, which is not acceptable. So to deal with that, people usually go with uh, uh, dropouts. So they intentionally drop outs, like add dropouts and they ignore samples while they're training their neural nets. But in the case of Decision trees, it's easier said than done. 
we need to go with something called random forest and I can discuss more at the end of the talk if someone is interested. But yeah, these things are what, what makes me think there's so much to do. It's not just about the numbers anymore. It's about the business. It's about what's the business trying to do. Someone is just interested in numbers. They would be more inclined to giving guarantees that, hey, there'd be no fraud transactions which will be declined. But you'll be surprised. I might have been using my own card in UK, doing a fraud and asking for a cash back later on. I could have done that. People do it. You can order a mattress on Amazon of the wrong size. While returning, they would say, just keep it. Is this fraud? I think it is. But the next time you do it, is it malicious? And if a lot of people do it, what happens to the ones who really had a problem? So with that, end my talk. Thank you. <laughs>